thank you for having me. I uh, I appreciate you uh, having this very important conversation. Uh, my name is Tatiana Bolton, and I'm the policy director for cybersecurity and emerging threats at R Street Institute, where Bryson is also a senior fellow. Uh, prior to joining R Street, I was the policy director at the Cyberspace Solarium Commission and the cyber policy lead at CISA, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, which so many people still don't know about. Uh, sad. As part of the cybersecurity workforce, I'm watching emerging threats, uh, things that are going to impact us in the future and perhaps, perhaps 20, perhaps two years down the line. And some of what I see matches the focus of policymakers and some doesn't. So I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that you're not really surprised by all of the high profile ransomware incidents this year. You saw the threat of ransomware coming, although pol many policymakers didn't. Ransomware has now made the top of the list of the most salient threats facing the cybersecurity community today. Both CISA, the White House, and the UK's GCHQ have all put it on the top of their lists of threats facing the global community. Uh, and thanks to the number of recent newsworthy hacks, Kaseya, JBS, Colonial Pipeline, to name the most noteworthy, ransomware is finally getting the attention it deserves. But I'm here today to discuss what I believe is an even greater threat to the cybersecurity community and one that isn't making headlines in the news, our lack of diversity uh, in our workforce. So let's just take a moment to compare the two threats. Yes, so ransomware is a massive threat that has recently affected more than 37% of organizations, according to Sophos. From driving gas panics in June to more recently forcing grocery stores and schools offline, ransomware has affected all areas of public life. But while 37% is a high number, it's nothing compared to the 100% of organizations affected by poor diversity numbers and a tapped cybersecurity workforce. I mean, which one of your organizations isn't affected by it? The Cybersecurity Ventures official annual cybercrime report estimated that ransomware could cost companies approximately $20 billion in lost revenue. But on the workforce side, uh, the United States on the whole is losing somewhere in the neighborhood of several trillion dollars in lost revenue by keeping women, for example, on the sidelines of our workforce. But before we dig into the problem, let's define it. Diversity is partly what you're thinking race, ethnicity, gender, and other underrepresented communities. But I'm also referring to people with different native language skills, for example. In 2015, researchers discovered the snow globe malware, also known as Babar. And Babar is also the name of a popular French TV show. And this linguistic and cultural clue helped French-speaking researchers trace it back to its original creator, France's external intelligence agency. Teams with language diversity bring a broader understanding to a cyberspace that is global by default. Diversity also means bringing in the neurodiverse community. The Cyberspace Solarium Commission, of which I was part, recommended that the neurodiverse should be included in the cyber workforce as they bring unique skills to the table. Some on the autism spectrum, for example, are adept at spotting patterns where others can't. That's why military, national security, and health organizations in the UK, Australia, and Israel have developed special hiring programs to attract neurodiverse individuals. Companies like Bank of America have gone further, incorporating neurodiverse talent as part of their hiring strategy. It also includes hiring people who come from different economic backgrounds, working styles, and thought processes. Because diversity of thought isn't just relegated to men versus women or black versus white. With a holistic understanding of diversity, we can paint a better picture of how to foster a truly diverse cybersecurity workforce, even if it shows us how much work there's left to be done. Look, diversity is not just about checking boxes or being woke. It's a real concern for the overall security of the industry and its effectiveness. From my perspective, working on cybersecurity through a national security lens, it's detrimental to our defense. A lack of diversity can make organizations weaker to vulnerabilities. A homogenous workforce tends to execute similar working styles, similar perspectives, and similar problem-solving techniques, and that's dangerous. These teams are also more susceptible to groupthink, falling into patterns of behavior, and have a tendency to avoid change. MIT found that this environment doesn't just mean a likelihood of more mistakes. It means that, unfortunately, people are more likely to copy poor decisions within a team. 
Now that means we may not see uh, the ransomware attack coming because our existing workforce has worked together, learned together, and think the same way. A recent study found that inclusive teams made both better and quicker decisions. People still tell me that pulling in diversity is just weakening the talent pool, but that simply isn't true. According to the Harvard Business Review, diverse teams demonstra demonstrably perform better, focusing, focusing more on the facts and processing those facts more carefully. They're also more innovative. In fact, companies that performed best in the last recession were those who had the most women on their corporate boards, helping demonstrate the point that diversity in the workforce leads to improved performance, and cybersecurity isn't any different. Attaining this objective means expanding the concept of what society sees as a cybersecurity professional, including in the leadership ranks. Cyber is about more than computer science, not that women and minorities are bad at that either, and requires skills like analysis, creative thinking, and communication, at which t women tend to excel. New blood and new thinking is advantageous in many ways. In 2021, a new female employee at FireEye caught a discrepancy in an employee file and flagged it for per proper procedure for immediate review as potentially fraudulent. Most veteran, veteran employees, Kevin Mandia, Kevin Mandia argued on the cipher brief, might not have flagged it as a top security priority, but because she had a different perspective, this new employee alerted FireEye to one of the biggest breaches in recent memory. If it hadn't been for her, who knows when we would have discovered the SolarWinds breach. This is just one example of how we're missing out on still having a predominantly homogenous cybersecurity workforce in 2021. Women, for example, were among the first programmers, invented the science of cryptography, and worked as code girls as early as 1941. But 80 years later, the field consists of a mere 24% women. That's not a lot of progress to show for the 21st century. For African Americans, they make up only 11.9% of the information security analysts in 2020. Latin Americans fared little better, taking up only 15.8% of the workforce. These figures don't inspire confidence, and they don't make much sense considering the sustained high demand for talent, which has become so overwhelming to the tune of 464,000 vacancies, that's of today, that companies are struggling to hire competent and trained people. So we're, we've, we're disappointed with two aspects of the hiring process, but the workforce remains woefully homogenous. And with such a gap in the workforce, it's hard not to be disappointed. But it also raises the question of why our cybersecurity workforce looks the way it does. How do we get here? Well, first, I, I think too many people continue to think it isn't a problem. Second, structurally, the winnowing starts early. Reducing, reducing the number of women and minorities in our particular field due to a lack of appeal to girls at an early age, a lack of mentors, and unconscious as well as overt bias. Women are not given constructive criticism to improve and don't get promoted at the same rates as men. Moreover, assertiveness, which is seen as a leadership quality in men, remains seen as a negative in women. Pay inequities continue to persist in the field and the workforce at large according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What's worse, women of color face even steeper challenges in both pay equity and promotion than their white female counterparts. As the Director of Strategic Threat Development at Recorded Future argued, the wide variety of people and experience we have defending our networks, the better our chances of success. And these barriers prevent women from participating fully in the cybersecurity field. Despite the efforts of organizations like Blacks in Cyber, Black Cybersecurity Association, Empower, and Share the Mic in Cyber, and many, many, uh, many more, many Blacks or minorities with interest in cybersecurities are struggling to break in. And with the growing need for more cyber professionals, it's imperative that we acknowledge the effects of the lack of diversity and take a look at some of the barriers to entry. So along with pipeline issues, barriers to entry have played a role in stifling diversity. No matter the field or person, everyone needs their first break for a job. Understandably, due to its nature, recruiters and hiring managers within the field of cybersecurity must be highly selective with its candidates. 
However, to diversify the pool of candidates, there should be room to make room. And by making room, I mean that we have to shift and take a look at some of the factors that hinder diverse individuals from considering the field, applying for jobs, or getting hired. Some of the things to consider include the lack of mentors, need for technical training, lack of financial resources, langu and language and ads and cybersecurity jobs, criteria for entry-level roles like traditional educational background, and last but certainly not least, the unwillingness to give someone a chance. In the interest of time, I'll share my thoughts on three barriers, mentorship, recruitment, and entry-level job criteria. To start, people strive to become who or what they can see. It allows them to have a living visual representation of a goal. If you ask children what they wanna be when they grow up, how many would say cybersecurity analyst? Answers like firefighter, teacher, doctor, hairdresser aren't shocking because many, more than likely, the child has experienced or seen someone working in that role. Cybersecurity is a bit different. While we work in the role, uh, it's not seen as glamorous and the good guys are in the background and only those interested in it talk about it. And that's why I started the Making Space Pledge to ensure professionals that up and comers see on stages and panels and Zooms aren't just white men. They're all of us. And they include women and people of color, a pledge to which more than 50 organizations and individuals have signed on. Starting with this small step, we can get more talent interested in cybersecurity and grow the diversity of our workforce from an early age. So what would make the industry appealing to someone who hasn't heard of it and doesn't know anyone who works in it? A mentor. Mentorship is one of the most powerful ways to influence and possibly change the course of someone's life. After all, an HR study found that mentees are five times more likely to get promoted than those without a mentor, and women and minorities are much less likely to have a mentor than white men. We need more and more diverse professionals in the field to make themselves available and to advocate for their mentees, a step that goes beyond answering questions, but truly supporting young professionals' careers. And by doing so, the field will seem less foreign and hopefully become more appealing to those who were not previously exposed to its opportunities. Secondly, we need to take a look at how and where the jobs are advertised. If people don't know about opportunities, how will they apply? We need to start looking at traditional and non-traditional ways to get the word out. We're all familiar with popular job search websites, but also in, we also live in the age of social media advertising, where 79% of job seekers use social media in their search. If we've been missing the mark with reaching a more diverse pool of candidates, then it's time to shift the focus. We need to go where the diverse candidates are. If they're going to boot camps, we need to work with their school's career centers. And perhaps that person who took a boot camp and came from a university not normally known to foster cybersecurity talent will have just the right background to respond to the next ransomware attack or think like the attacker. Lastly, we need to take a look at why those who are interested in cybersecurity and who, who do apply for jobs don't get hired. When prerequisites are determined for entry-level roles, how much is taken into consideration about the absolute necessity of required skills versus nice-to-haves? Aptitude and potential to thrive in a role may be, weeded out, may be weeded out early on simply because they didn't have experience or don't meet traditional criteria, like a bachelor's degree from a prestigious university. Or they may simply present differently than a typical candidate. What about your interview process? Focus on competencies and aptitude rather than experience. When candidates make it to the final round of an interview but aren't selected and have talent, what happens? Can those with aptitude be funneled into a training program or a boot camp? When new opportunities arise, do you go back and revisit past applicants or start with a brand new search? All in all, barriers exist that can't be ignored if we truly want to solve the diversity problem. So what should we change and what can we do differently? I think we need to work on building a pipeline at the high school and even middle school level, some of which we do, but we need to supercharge it. We need to work with specialized schools and boot camps to find talent for recruitment. We need to resource government agency hiring departments so that hiring and talent management are a priority for our federal government and make cybersecurity cachet, like the intelligence community. We need to offer uh, scholarships for training to launch careers in cybersecurity. Malwarebytes, for example, was offering 10, $10,000 scholarships to those who applied before July 1st of this year. 
uh, we need to identify lower level tasks and the responsibility to help create more entry level jobs where individuals have an opportunity to get their foot in the door and show potential and stop requiring bachelor's degrees and five years of experience. Uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah, we see. Yep. Yeah. So you all could see us, but we lost. We lost Tatiana again. Right as right as we were getting to the solutioning, right? Like you know, we build up the problem, and then it's like solve it, and starts with and internet then it goes away. <laughs> I'm actually back now. Oh, she's back. <laughs> okay, great. Today is the worst. Um. Okay, tell me, tell me where I left off. Uh, you were right in the middle of the uh, the second point. Um, um, so we just talked about high schools, middle schools. Yeah, you don't have to like stop requiring bachelor's five degrees. Years. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely think we need to stop requiring bachelor's degrees when we're talking about junior uh, level uh, junior level positions. You may not realize it, but there are natural gender discrepancies for applicants, for example. Uh, when women apply for a job, they want to feel like they've met 100% of job requirements. And men apply when they feel like they've met 60% of those requirements. So just at the front end, you're missing a significant portion of qualified applicants by increasing those requirements. We also need to avoid tokenism and performative diversity. Uh, and we need to showcase star employees outside of cybersecurity-focused platforms and mediums. It's important to put a face to those who typically work behind the scenes. Some go to resources and uh, to leverage include the Making Space Pledge on our site, cybersecurity influencers and podcasts, uh, and cybersecurity tech recruiters. And lastly, listen. Take the time to engage with minority colleagues and hear their perspectives and ask them for their ideas. Demand for cybersecurity talent has become so overwhelming that the US government and private industry must, as a matter of national security, eliminate the systemic barriers that are preventing employers from tapping into women and minorities as a source of potential cybersecurity aptitude. The math is simple. We must recruit women and people of color into cybersecurity. Just like we've been urging companies for years to take the threat of ransomware and zero days seriously is where we are now with the threat to our cyber workforce. If we don't ad address the growing gap in cyber professionals and the need to invest in bringing diverse backgrounds and perspectives into cybersecurity, 10 years from now, we may be in a hole we can't fill. Let's not get to a place where it becomes an emergency and let's take diversity as security seriously today. Thanks so much. So how can we get um, the folks that are watching this involved? What can they do? Well, like I said, so one, um, start to think of yourself as part of the solution. Uh, if there are uh, opportunities in your organization, try to target, try to find people that you know that are, uh, that are women or people of color that you think might be good for the role and encourage them to apply. You may think they'd apply anyway, but you, it's actually not so, much, so certain because a lot of, like I said, a lot of women wait till they feel like they're 100% qualified. So if you, know, if you know a woman who is qualified for a position in your organization and you, you believe in that person, encourage them. Tell them that you know, they don't need to necessarily be 100% perfect for the role. Uh, throw in your resume and see what happens. Yeah, it's very interesting that idea of feeling like you have to be 100%. I mean, I felt it too, right? I think I think it's so interesting. Why do you think that happens? I think we have a culture where we set different standards for women and for men. Um, we have, uh, you know, our culture generally uh, 
sort of encourages women to be quieter and ask less questions and be less aggressive. And so when they're in the classroom, that's a perfect uh, recipe to get great grades and it's a, it's a perfect recipe to excel. You don't necessarily need to raise your hand to succeed. But when you get outside of school, that recipe no longer works and men are encouraged to be more aggressive, to uh, apply for uh, positions even when they may not feel as 100% quali qualified. They're encouraged to uh, go, you know, sort of go forth and prosper based on their potential. Um, and they're hired based on potential. They're promoted based on potential. And we've seen through numerous studies that that's not true for women and minorities. Very interesting. Thank you. It was yeah. a really great talk. I was like taking a bunch of notes. Yeah, the part that really got attention on Discord was the quote of stop asking for five years of experience. And so that I think is the, the other challenge beyond how do we get hiring managers out of that mindset? Because a hiring manager is going, I want to ha see somebody with certifications and the, the talk afterward, we're going to be talking about certifications uh, because it's it's the CYA for the, the hiring manager, right? I don't get fired for hiring somebody that looked right on paper. I get, I think I'll get fired or I'll get in trouble for hiring somebody that wasn't a fit on paper. And I think that that's also like a, a, a leadership issue, right? From the very top. You need to have people who are invested in the diversity of the workforce because it brings strength to the organization. We have to get away from this concept of diversity as tokenism and that, you know, you know, we're just trying to pull in people who like you're trying to pull in a woman because you don't have a woman or you're trying to pull in someone who's black because you don't have a, a, any black employees. People are bringing uh, different perspectives and different backgrounds to the table when when uh, they're coming from different experiences. That's the strength you're bringing. And so while they may not, while they may have a diverse background or they may not, um, you're bringing in different. Um, a, a different and a stronger uh, workforce. And so leaders need to acknowledge the fact that like you may not have five years of background, but that doesn't mean you don't have the aptitude. We need to switch to more of an aptitude model. Um, you know, for example, the military, right? They take into account where you uh, where you come from, what your background is. And Bryson, I feel like you can talk to this more, but like they, they at least, uh, a little bit and in israel for example they do this a lot more they take your aptitude and fit you into the into the role where they think you'll most thrive and that's not based on any experience it's just based on aptitude so we need to take what works in places like uh like israel and and uh, partially uh our military and use it in the private sector and use it across the federal government i mean i don't bryson talk uh, you uh you've got some background of that you're on mute Thanks. This goes, yeah, I got a new microphone set up. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing it on purpose so that you feel like you're not the only one with technical challenges, thank Tatiana. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Such a no, giver. But so, yeah, thank you. I, I give and I just, I, I give through mistakes. You give and you That's give. You give and you give. Sorry, uh, sorry about your experience. Yeah, no, the, so part of what's hard about that is being able to, to properly qualify that candidate like what does that mean what are the skills and having the data to back up how those you know the that aptitude and what that looks like because what you find that i see is more often it's kind of the statistical test bias where you are actually restricting diversity through those kinds of assessments and testing hmm. well so you know i also think it's important to just give people a chance um, you're doing interviews, right? So make sure at least at the interview stage where you're bringing people in that you've got a diverse pool of applicants. Check yourself. Like a lot of the, it's funny, there was one study that said people who consider themselves, um, people who consider that uh, they've got this whole like diversity thing down and they're, they're, you know, they understand it and they don't have an issue. They're the ones who are most at fault. Or they, uh, they do it the worst of anyone because they don't check themselves when they're either looking through resumes, when they're moving people forward in the process, when they're reviewing uh, assessments and other things. Be when you, when you acknowledge that you have bias, that is when you uh, acknowledge that you need to uh, check for it. 
in all of your steps and all the processes. And so organizations need to do that. People need to do that. You need to just take a take a step back and say, am I am I doing am I doing this for the right reason? Am I uh, excluding people based on preconceived notions I have, based on their location, based on their name, based on their background or uh, university or whatever? Um, and it, and and by doing that, you will I think uh, more more often than not, and this has been proven through research pull pull diverse applicants into your pool when otherwise you would generally gravitate towards people who are uh who you feel more comfortable with uh it's a human it's a natural human response right to to talk to and engage with people who are like ourselves right that's a natural human response and no one no one's saying that's bad we just need to acknowledge that and acknowledge our own biases for example you know if you went to georgetown you might be more likely to think of georgetown graduates as smart amazing people uh but that, you know but that doesn't that that's a bias in and of itself right so we need to account for these things when we are um when we're in that hiring process question from the audience how can the federal government or dod get more diverse candidates in front of hiring boards oh here's 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 one uh completely redo the usa jobs portal <laughs> that thing is a piece of crap um it so the whole that whole system i mean this is like a systemic issue for the federal government and obviously not a short-term solution um maybe we'll, maybe i'll get to that in a second but like one of the biggest things they can do is is just completely rejigger their hiring and firing process um the the way in which usa jobs works uh you know obviously it was set up to prevent like nepotism and uh prevent people from uh abuses of the system uh because you're providing uh you know you're using taxpayer money to give a federal job uh, basically uh, very difficult to fire you after this uh process um but you have to know the system right like you have to submit a resume that is exactly tailored to each job that you do you have to make sure that you're hitting all of the like key points you have to make sure that you uh know how the how the computer first reads resumes to really understand the process you have to know how to answer ksas you the those stupid questions that they have you do which basically top tip you have to say five on all of them whether or not you're even qualified um to get through the process uh and then you have to you know go through that process the federal government needs to acknowledge that this is a broken system you're not getting the best candidates you're not getting uh highly qualified applicants even you're losing a lot of talent through the system in the short term i think um the federal government especially in the cybersecurity world needs to needs to use more of their direct hire authority which allows them to uh and lean into the uh, uh the new cyber talent management system that dhs is piloting and systems within dod where they can go out to a broader uh a broader pool and uh and and get more diverse applicants they can also do that by going to taking their career fairs outside of the beltway and going into more rural communities going to uh you know historically black colleges and universities going to uh, you know just just changing up the traditional way in which they do hiring another question how best to engage local officials and leaders to raise the issue among local schools and universities how should we get our communities and local business leaders involved so I think that it we need to just have continue to have these conversations where we uh, where we talk about what is diversity, who is included, like I mentioned, language diversity and neurodiverse individuals as well as people of color and women, right? We need to show them where the benefit is. We need to show them why it's better. Bring them some of those numbers, some of those statistics I mentioned. Um, show them that it can help their um, you know sort of help their business it's not going to weaken your talent pool it's going to strengthen your talent pool plus i mean we have so many so many uh openings we're not going to be able to fill them with our existing workforce that just tells you that you need to broaden the workforce and you need to bring in new people from a new pipeline right um you know use the use the existing uh processes that we have that connect schools to boot camps and universities and uh the business community use that whole system uh in a more intertwined way so that you are uh broaden it 
right? Broaden it and and connect uh, connect smart, uh, capable uh, students at an earlier age into internships and things like that. All right. Any final thoughts? I just, you know, I think that this is a much bigger problem than anyone is thinks that it is. Uh, there, but what what always happens is this gets kind of relegated to a certain subset of people. It's seen sometimes as like you know uh, you know uh, if you go down into the workforce uh, role, if you are talking about the workforce, if you're talking about that in cybersecurity, well, they're really like no, you're just a workforce person. But it's it's everybody for for people for businesses uh, for the federal government, honestly. Um, were your people are your number one resource. I've heard so many so many businesses say that, but yet they still are unwilling to make the investment and the, and, and put in the time to really think about their hiring processes and, and revamp things that have been in place for the last 50 years. And so we need to do that and we need to change our culture to really improve uh, diversity and to make uh, make our network secure. All right, last shout out to your initiative. Oh yes, uh, check out Making Space uh, on the uh, R Street website, rstreet.org, and uh, all of the work that we're doing there. If any organ, if anyone's out there that are that's working at an organization that is, is supportive of diversity and diversity efforts, it's not really that that ha big a lift. All we're suggesting is that if you're hosting a panel or you're hosting an event, invite invite at least one woman or one person of color to speak on those panels. Uh, that it's a small step, but I think it you know, we're, it's trying to move people in the right direction. So please come and join us in our efforts. And thanks very much, Bryson, for having me on. All right, thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, it was fantastic. What a way to kick thanks, it off, Bryson. huh? Yeah, no, really sets the tone. Again, this conference is about bringing new voices to the table. Um, and one of the things I think that we do that's a little special about that is we're not just throwing them to the wolves, the proverbial wolves, we're pairing them with coaches. So they get somebody to help them get over whatever they need. You know, Maybe there's something in the, the research, maybe they're uncomfortable presenting, maybe they just need somebody to make them feel a little bit better about going up on stage for that first time. And so that's, I, I think that's really um, what makes this conference special and helps drive, again, the diversity of voices that we need to, to look at these problems. Yeah, 100%. and can I can I just add one more thing? I have a I have a couple of pictures which are very entertaining. Um, to those that say that this is still not uh, not a not a problem. Um, so can you see my screen? Yep. All right. Uh, just check check this beauty out. Okay. Some of this is in the 1950s, right? But some of this is today. Look at look at look at the that lovely collection of white men. If you're telling me that this isn't a problem, take a look around. Like this is this happened. One of these happened last month at the EU Cyber Summit. Look at that. I mean, come now, come now. All right, you can take it back over now. <laughs> I rest my case. Making space. Making space. <laughs>